it's really amazing how you know Tompkins, when he comes to Chile, creates all these enemies and creates all this backlash among powerful people. So when I'm doing the biography of Doug Tompkins, what I try and do is look at the different threads of a man, not by what's already out there, because I didn't believe what was already out there. So I interviewed maybe 160 people. He he, were, he lived in a basement in Squaw Valley. He partied his brains out with Janis Joplin. John Wenner, the founder of Rolling Stone, was his buddy. And Tompkins is this kind of weird visionary who's half mad climber and half nerd. I mean, the dude is really a nerd. He's always reading and studying, and he's kind of a, I don't know, there's definitely some kind of kamikaze gene here because the guy is definitely like a rocket ship. Welcome to the Possibus. The Possibus is a podcast collaboration between the Smithsonian Earth Optimism and Pelicanus. The Smithsonian Conservation Commons Earth Optimism Initiative is changing the conservation narrative from one that focuses on problems and perils to highlighting impactful solutions. By celebrating what's working in conservation, they seek to inspire action and move global community from a sense of loss to one of hope and finding solutions to save our planet. Pelicanus is a conservation-based collective in continuous wonder of the healing and encouragement that is possible on this planet and the people making it happen. We are committed to telling these stories and demonstrating optimism through science. Now in this partnership, we spotlight conservationists working with a possibilistic attitude for solution-based efforts to tackle the world's critical environmental struggles. We're attempting to reframe the narrative around conservation to show that conservation successes are possible through changes in attitude and implementation of intentional change. On today's episode of The Possibilist, we talked to Jonathan Franklin, an author and investigative journalist. Jonathan has written multiple books and dozens and dozens of articles for The Guardian, The New York Times, and others on topics ranging from narcos in Colombia to interviewing Timothy McVeigh in prison, among so much more. His latest book, A Wild Idea, is the biography of Doug Tompkins, the founder of apparel companies The North Face and Esprit, who then moved to Chile to purchase large amounts of lands for the sole purpose of conservation and rewilding. In this conversation, we dive deep into the book and the life of Doug Tompkins, so please, Enjoy our conversation with Jonathan Franklin about the amazing story of Doug Tompkins and his love affair with South America and Patagonia. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're really excited to have you. We we all finished the book just in the last uh, week or so. Uh, Taylor said he finished it last night, went through about 200 pages in one night <laughs> just to finish it up. Um, I listened to it on Audible. Uh, that was a really cool way to listen to it. Uh, I'm still learning how to read. Uh, <laughs> um, but no, we, we really, really enjoyed it. So uh, before we get into the, the book and the whole story, can you uh, just kind of share, tell us who you are and share your story in, in uh, the environmental field and uh, conservation? Yeah, I think um, most of my connection to conservation has to do with that I grew up in a very lucky zip code. Uh, where I grew up in Lincoln, Massachusetts, is probably 30% conservation land. Um, it's right next to uh, Walden Pond. So, you know, when you're in third grade, you go to Thoreau's house and look at it when you're a third grader, which is always good for third grade brains. And uh, I think that my, my father was a huge influence as well because he, uh, he had gone to Dartmouth and he had been in the outing club. So we were still allowed to... Uh, you know, wander through the streams of New Hampshire and Vermont and get leeches on our legs as small children. So I think I was an expert at ripping leeches off my leg by about, you know, if you had less than 10 leeches, it was a good day. But, and then my mother said to me as a small child, she said, I promise, I promise I'll never take you to Disneyland. But instead she took us to Nova Scotia and we'd go squid fishing at midnight or so really, uh, a New England kind of a wildlife experience. There are lots and lots of time in New Hampshire and the White Mountains, lots of times in Vermont. So I think that um, given that I grew up in a small town in the woods, you know, since I was a little kid, I was terrified of deserts. I hate deserts. Even to this day, the deserts scare the crap out of me. But you can you could drop me in any forest in the world, drop me the taiga, whatever, even with the tigers and all. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a forest guy. That's funny because we, we actually grew up in the desert of Southern California. I know. <laughs> and I'm actually with you. I, it, it, it's it's a, an intimidating place. <laughs> so you are a uh, an investigative journalist by trade. You have a, a few books that uh, that you've that you've written as well. Um, 
from the 438 days about the uh, the guy stuck on the boat <laughs> to the uh, 33 men, the, the Chilean miner story, to the book we're going to talk about today, A Wild Idea about Doug Tompkins and all the stuff he did in his life. Um, so can you talk right. a little bit about some of the, the investigative journalism, uh, some of the books you've uh, written about uh, conservation or in the environmental field? You know, as a, as a young journalist, I was working at the New York Times and I was, uh, I was getting in trouble all the time because you're not allowed to go to undercover, but I was really into infiltrating the extreme, extreme right wing. Like, like I shaved my head and I got like, uh, I hung up for a while and I interviewed Tim McVeigh in prison. And then uh, I, w I, w I was investigating a lot the wise use movement in the early 90s because there was a kind of industry funded attempt to um, stop direct activism because Earth First and some of the actions to save the growth forests in the Pacific Northwest and Canada and British Columbia and where I was in Northern California um, were very effective. The idea of somebody climbing a tree or chaining themselves to a bulldozer was perfect because the bulldozer dude wasn't getting paid enough money to kill an activist. Uh, and so I think that uh, I, I was very much, you know, in my heart, I probably should have been on a Sea Shepherds, you know, for 10 or 20 years to get out of my system. But, but uh, so I, I, I kind of cut my teeth covering um, the FBI campaigns to screw uh, Dave Foreman, the FBI campaigns to destroy Earth First, um, the FBI campaigns against um, the people who were, who were freeing minks and animals, uh, you know, Minnesota, more, more in the central part of the country. So I, I think that... Uh, I, I grew up, you know, I grew up in the late 60s, early 70s. I was really into street activism. So for me, journalism was a way to do activism and not go to jail. I like that. Journalism as a, a, a way to do activism without going to jail. <laughs> if we had titles for these episodes, maybe that's a good one for it. <laughs> you know, we came at it from kind of a different side. You know, we, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's, I guess it's similar. We kind of same kind of thing we came up into this field in the early 2000s and you know bush administration and it just kind of you want to do something and you know candlelight vigils are great for what they are but you know you don't feel like you're doing much so we kind of took that energy and just kind of put it into something that we enjoyed and then into conservation so i think it's really cool that you were able to kind of do the same thing and, and really get into it and to kind of go undercover because that, that's super interesting. And we could have a whole other uh, conversation just about that, I'm sure. <laughs> no, one, in, in, one, in one year, I'm going to do some remarkable undercover reporting. So in a year, we'll do so we can touch base again. But I really think that my background after that was, um, you know, kind of infiltrating organized criminal groups. I spent a lot of time covering the narco wars of Central and South America. Um, and so for me, what was interesting was to be able to, uh, you know, spend a week talking to narcos and hitmen and then spend a week to the special forces. And what I would do was um, I would get all the, the special forces would give me all the dirt on the narcos and the narcos would give me all the dirt on the special forces. And they would both want to know the answers from the other side. So the narcos would be like 10 grand if you tell us when their helicopters are in maintenance. I spent a lot of time investigating and living with hitmen and, um, you know, narco dudes on islands in the Caribbean and stuff. And so I think that uh, it was kind of useless, like 10 years of my life, because I almost died a lot. And I've got seven kids, seven daughters. And so it was a little bit, you know, too egocentric because I was doing it because it was so much fun to jump out of helicopter or just like, you know, do drugs with narcos. Um, but in the end, I, I couldn't tell my kids what I was doing. So I could apply it to, to, uh, positive stories like some Chilean miners who survive or a fisherman survives or Doug Tompkins who takes on the entire Chilean government and is able to, you know, convince a generation of Chilean, you know, activists that their crazy dream of saving Patagonia is actually possible. So I, I come from, I, it's kind of a, it's a long circle. You know, I started off doing environmental activism then I needed money because all these kids. So I worked for Playboy and like interviewed narcos for like 10 years, made tons of money, almost died. But now my kids in college, so I don't need so much money anymore. First time ever, my kid paid my phone bill yesterday. It's kind of a major accomplishment. Uh, and they gave me a bike for a mountain bike for Christmas. I bought like 30 bikes for kids over the years. So now I can spend my time infiltrating, I don't know, some copper union that's trying to blow up a mountain in Ecuador or something. So I'm really looking forward to going in and going undercover because I think that uh, 
there are so many environmental crimes happening that people who've covered organized crimes and narcos are perfectly qualified to protect the environment, unfortunately. Yeah, you know, it's funny because Taylor and I had a conversation a few days ago about, um, about Doug and based off of reading this book about how, you know, he and I were like, all right, we've done some cool stuff. We've backpacked, we've, we've traveled to do, you know, to do some cool stuff. And part of <laughs> one of the things we did was go down to Valle Chacabuco about 12 years ago. Uh, and, and that was really awesome. But, you know, when you read stories about Doug and now the stories I'm hearing about you, I'm like, yeah, we haven't really done anything. <laughs> and you have that really cool connection with Doug uh, that, you know, I think is maybe that's why you, you, you gravitated toward this story. I think, no, the, re the reason I gravitated um, towards Doug's story was actually a suicide. And it, what happened is that uh, my best friend growing up uh, was a genius, like really good athlete, super smart. And we both went to New York at the same time. And he being super smart and all, got a job working as an investment banker. And he was the kind of guy who, if he had started up, you know, Habitat for Humanity, the dude would have, you know, created 30,000 houses. If he had worked with Jacques Cousteau, he would have, you know, the guy was really great heart, really hard worker. Um, but when he was 29, he committed suicide. And I blame a little bit the, uh, the whole culture of, you know, you know, hard scrabble capitalism, investment banker. And he used to always say, oh, once I get my cash, once I get my nut, then I'll do good things for the world. At 29, he shot himself in the head. And so I think that uh, when I saw that Tompkins had actually done what my best friend had said he was going to do, I thought, that is so rare. Nobody actually pulls it off. Nobody at 49 with the big million dollar house in San Francisco and the invitations to the White House and all that. Nobody said, hey, what? You know what? I'm going to cash in my chips. I'm going to go live in Patagonia. I don't need electricity. I don't need neighbors. I have a dream and I'm going to follow it. That was what was somewhat remarkable. And because my best friend had had the same capabilities of Doug, but had killed himself, when I saw that Doug had actually done it, it made me really want to figure out, you know, how he did it and promote that idea. Because I think there's a, there's a 10,000 people out there with all the money they ever need to live. And half of them have crazy conservation dreams, but only like 1% will actually do anything. So the whole point of this book is that somebody somewhere will make one more park. I don't care if it's like, oh, or if it's in Anna or Prague, but the whole idea uh, is to say, you know, everybody can do their part. Yeah, I think that's a really good message from, from his story is everyone can do their part. And so I think we should just get into the book. You know, like I said, we, we loved it. Um, I finished it last weekend and I haven't been able to, you know, not think I obviously we're doing this interview so I've been thinking about right. it but like I can't get it out of my mind what what he was able to accomplish and the whole story arc but it's hard because it's you know someone asked me like oh what what's you know I said I were doing an interview and like oh well, what is it I was like well <laughs> so it's about this book but they're like well what's the book about I was like well it's part business book part biography part ecological conservation story but every other page has an adventure on it. We're about when they're going kayaking down a river or they're in a, stuck in a cave for 34 days or whatever it was. And so how, how did you, how were you able to kind of put together all of these, you know, hundred different stories and from all different people he had such an impact on, how were you able to put that into a, a story that is, was, you know, again, was so compelling. For me, it was interesting because one of Doug Tompkins favorite things in life was a quilt he spent a lot of time in Pennsylvania um, buying up some of the world's most beautiful quilts. And he liked the perfection of it. He liked that they were handmade. He liked the lifestyle behind them. He actually did some major quilt books, major quilt uh, exhibits. And I like Doug Tompkins is a quilt because he's a man who really should have gone to the Ivy League. He was kind of breeded uh, to, be, to be a young Yale guy, but he fell in love with climbing. So he became an amazing climber and it was actually perfect for his personality because it, it was, it was problem solving on the fly. It was finding the limits to life and death. It was sharing experiences with buddies who you're going to hopefully be in touch with the rest of your life. Technical, a full, the challenge of physics and, uh, and uh, understanding, you know, the ropes in the carabiner. One of the, one of the, 
the tools that Doug Tompkins and Yvonne Chouinard really loved were wool gloves with no fingers. And that was for them was like, holy crap, we can actually climb with wool gloves with no fingers, you know? And you see the photos of these guys, they have like alpaca scarves on, you know, they'll be climbing all their scarf will blow off or like, you know, the, their lace up leather boots and their, the whole thing was totally analog in the best way. And, you know, they didn't want help. They didn't want to have a rescue team come get them. They didn't want to have a cell phone. And if they had seen a drone, they were throwing rocks at it, you know, or these guys were, real hardcore when they were hungry they would go down to the valley and they would kill a sheep and they would skin it and they understood probably to their own convenience that if you ate the sheep but left the skin that was considered like fair game because you were just a you know dirtbag climber of course you needed to eat but you couldn't take the skin so they would always justify stealing sheep but these are dudes who would come down steal a sheep uh skin it leave the leave the hide in some sort of weird frontier justice then you know, pull off that sheep for weeks inside a cave. You know, this is not your uh, your average dude. So, for for me, what I wanted to do was I wanted to I wanted to erase the image of Doug Tompkins that exists in South America because that was the image done by real right wing press and um, big business and corporations who were freaked that this one dude could stop you know, their aluminum smelter, you know, they had the whole plan to put an aluminum smelter, pollute Patagonia, uh, fill the rivers with the discharges, tons of traffic, what's bringing in the, the raw materials, you know, massive amounts of electricity. I mean, Chile was about to turn Patagonia into, um, you know, the worst parts of New Jersey. Um, and thanks to Doug Tompkins, it's now going to be like the best parts of British Columbia. But if it hadn't been for Doug Tompkins, it would be like, they'd be like 20 years away from like some crappy like mini version of Newark. It's really amazing how, you know, Tompkins, when he comes to Chile, creates all these enemies and creates all this backlash among powerful people. So when I'm doing the biography of Doug Tompkins, what I try and do is look at the different threads of a man, um, not by what's already out there, because I didn't believe what was already out there. So I interviewed maybe 160 people. And so I have like 5,000 pages, maybe 4,000, 5,000 pages of interviews with Doug Tompkins. So I, I can read through that and I can have his, you know, his, his friends from fourth grade, his friends from seventh grade, his girlfriends from high school. You know, so, you know he, worked, he worked at the Jerome Hotel. He, he, worked, he lived in a basement in Squaw Valley. He partied his brains out with Janis Joplin. John Wenner, the founder of Rolling Stone, was his buddy. And Tompkins is this kind of weird visionary who's half mad climber and half nerd. I mean, the dude is really a nerd. He's always reading and studying and he's kind of a, I don't know, he, there's definitely some kind of kamikaze gene here because the guy is definitely like a rocket ship. And I think that throughout Doug's life, you have these different threads. And so what I try to do is interview from you know, the first years, to the end years and beyond, and then create this giant quilt and I think that I did a very good job, but I, it's definitely not the last book on Doug Tompkins. I hope there's 10 more because this guy, to really tell his story, you need to do a trilogy. I don't think I have, I don't think I have it in me, but I'm hoping that in 10, 20 years, we have like a shelf of Doug Tompkins books. No, I, I, I agree. Like I said, this, this could have been split up into three or four you know, books of their own just to keep, go completely into the whole business side, completely into... The ecological restoration side and even completely a whole book just to go into the the whole love story with him and chris so you know i'm really glad you brought up the quilt because as i was going through it the the quilt his uh, his obsession with quilts kept coming up and i just kept going what is it with the quilt so like why are these coming up and then when it came to like near the end I'm not sure, I honestly can't remember if, if you said it or if I just, if it just clicked, but like, well, his obsession with really nice antique things and quilts turned into this obsession with making these areas in Patagonia, like ecologically, you know, quote, perfect. Instead of having, you know, thing, you know, uh, dams or, and, you know, big, big developments come in, he was able to, to turn that obsession into uh, from like little things that he likes things are very, very much the way he liked them into let's restore this the way it should be. And so I really, really love that connection. Just so 
people that haven't read the book can kind of get a little bit of sense of, uh, of Doug Tompkins. You've already kind of mentioned a little bit, but can you kind of give a, a maybe like a quick just you know, synopsis of his life. I know it's going to be super hard <laughs> but with everything he's done, just to kind of give like a quick synopsis of, of what, how he started and where he ended up with uh, his work in Patagonia. Yeah, Doug Tompkins was a rebel uh, child who was raised in the upstate New York. Uh, Doug Tompkins' father would buy antique furniture for museums. So they, and they had a little plane, so they would fly around the country and they would look for antiques that were of the highest quality so they could sell to museums and they could put them in the airplane and fly them back. Now, this led to them negotiating in lots of churches because uh, the churches tended to have the roofs to protect the furniture, the money to polish them. So they would often be negotiating inside churches. So as a small child, uh, Doug Tompkins is flying around with his dad and his dad is buying museum quality furniture. And what happens here is he tells his son very early in life, there's only three kinds of furniture. There's good furniture, there's bad furniture, and there's exceptional furniture. Always go for the exceptional. And this kind of uh, mantra is drilled into his head for about the, from eight years old, nine years old. So very early on, he gets this amazing sense of aesthetics. And I think that as we see Doug Tompkins become a downhill skier when he's 13, 14, the aesthetics of the perfect line, of the perfect cut, he's, he can see it. You know, he's almost uh, reaching the Olympic level for skiing. And to train year round for skiing, he decides to go to South America. So he can spend, um, you know, June, July, August. And there's one particular place in Chile called Portillo, which is a world-class ski area and a lodge and just one of the, probably one of the hip, one of the hippest outdoor scenes on earth, especially in the sixties and seventies. And Tompkins goes there to train. And as he's training there, he falls in love with the Andes. He starts to, you know, he, instead of taking a regular charter jet home, he hitches hikes home on little jets and little, you know, biplanes and little uh, Cessnas back then. And so he falls in love with South America. So after coming back to the United States, he's decided that uh, he's going to start a little outdoor company because he's just seeing that everywhere he goes in the outdoors, more and more people are coming to the outdoors. So he, he starts a company called The North Face. And it's instantly successful. Great design, great logos, great products. He sells reindeer rugs, uh, which somebody brings him from like La Plandia. He sells bikinis from France. He's crampons and pitons from his best friend, Yvonne Chouinard, who later founds Patagonia. He's hanging out with this young tribe of climbers who are rebels, but they're on the cutting edge of a future you know, business, which is outdoor gear. So Tompkins becomes an accidental businessman, starts the North Face. He loves adventures in his life. So he'll spend eight months as CEO of a spree and four months chasing tigers in India. And what happens is that Doug Tompkins is a rare combination of a visionary entrepreneur, hardcore rebel, but the more money he gets, the more radical he gets. And by the early nineties, he's got $300 million and he's more radical than ever. He sells his company, moves to a shack in the ends of the earth in Southern Chile. And he starts funding all of these small environmental groups. He funds hundreds of groups that don't make it, you know, dozens of groups we've never heard of, but he also pours money into Rainforest, Rainforest Action Network with Randy Hay, with Earth Island Institute with Peter Brower, dozens of other rewilding campaigns with wolves. So he becomes this kind of shadow uh, capitalist and in his home country, which becomes Chile, he buys up abandoned farms, abandoned ranches by the dozens and he patches them together and he, and he creates this patchwork of out South America, then he expands to Argentina and nearby. And he becomes like the world's most like exquisite park designer in the same way that he wants to design tents for North Face or shirts for Esprit. So he's kind of this mad designer in the cockpit of a plane. And he's, he said, okay, well, park will go around the mountain, around the glacier, include the volcano and come back to the bay. So we have this kind of visionary dude with 300 million and he ends up saving 15 million acres along with his team. It's not just him by any shot, but he's kind of this mad captain and there's hundreds of people who are along for the ride and without whom he never would have done it. But he's clearly a leader. He's clearly a charismatic visionary. And this book, A Wild Idea, takes you from this young hyperactive sports dude who fortunately learned aesthetics from his dad to a man who actually designed some of the most beautiful parks on earth. This book is bananas dude um 
<laughs> like, like, like you're saying, like, I didn't know your history of, you know, uh, under undercover with right wing and working on narco stuff. And, but it makes sense. It makes sense, man. You've got this energy you've got, I mean, especially your other books that you've written, you've got this like extreme, um, uh, drive that you're pulling in and it makes sense that you're talking about Doug. Um, because there is this guy that, well, one of the things I wanted to bring up is like, I hate reading biographies a lot and I hate reading conservation biographies. Um, because a lot of times my heroes in the conservation movement, you know, I've been a conservationist for almost 20 years. This is my whole life. And when I learn about them, I go, man, that's not who I wanted you to be. But when I read this book, it's amazing because there's so much energy, so much intensity, and there's so much of a middle finger to so much of the status quo. And my question, you know, this is a long prelude to, a, to a, the question of how, who is this person? Because there's this energy, there's this intensity of Doug, but there's also like you, you paint a wonderful portrait of him. He also could be very challenging to deal with, very challenging to work with, um, very aggressive, very uh, particular. We met him. He was kind of an asshole to us. Um, at the same time, <laughs> at the same time as he was, Austin and I were like, yeah, but he's a, he's a lion and we get it. And so I guess all of that is to say, like, who is this person, Doug, who can be so challenging? And then you wrap the book up with, but then he also inspired this community around Patagonia and this love story with Chris Tompkins and, and how like you brought such a human element to it um, that I'm so grateful for. So I guess just tell us more about the humanity of Doug and, and your interaction with that. Okay. Doug, Tompkins, Doug Tompkins was a man who was able to speak to the farmer who was helping, helping him build a fence and Prince Charles. He had this remarkable ability to connect with people but only people who he found extremely interesting. So if you look at the life of Doug Tompkins, you'll see that he was with Prince Charles. He was with Janis Joplin. He was with the Grateful Dead. He was with the uh, uh, Hell's Angels. He was riding motorcycles in South America. He was stalking tigers in Europe. This guy was all over the map. And basically he was, he needed to live life about three times as fast as the rest of us. That led him to extreme sports mountain climbing, downhill skiing, and ice climbing. He becomes a conservationist based on this kind of deep deception that the beautiful parts of the world, the most beautiful corners where a climber, a hiker, a surfer, a kayaker might go. So I think that to really understand like Doug Tompkins, he's a perfectionist who's got a dream and a drive. And if he had a car, he, he probably wouldn't need a rear view mirror. And he, he abhorred seat belts. And when he hired people at his company, Esprit, he asked his head of human resources if they could, uh, if they could screen the applicants for having speeding tickets, because he thought that the more speeding tickets the person had, the more appropriate it was they work with him. And even in the 70s, you actually, I don't think you could get the DMV to like screen people's record to hire them, but that was his idea. You know, if you, if you had lots of speeding tickets, you were the kind of man or woman who wanted to work with him. And he was a busy man. He traveled seven, eight months a year, didn't see his kids very much. His wife traveled six months a year. They were running a global empire company and they really ran it the way they wanted to. So it's an old school capitalism, but that allowed him to sell out at a certain point, take his fortune and do, do whatever the heck he wanted, which was save the most pristine parts on earth. You can only save so many acres with $300 million. Then he goes down to Chile and he realizes they're selling the native forest back then it was $40 an acre. So for 300 million, you know, he saved millions and millions of acres. So it's a real mixture of a practical entrepreneur with an adventurer and a man who doesn't ever use a rearview mirror. That was a really interesting point. Cause you know, one of the, that's one of the things I was thinking about. I was like, why, I, I, I understood the connection between him and South America, but what, 
Like what made him not want to, you know, do as much of that work in, you know, where he's from in upstate New York or in British Columbia, but that makes total sense that you could do so much more with them, that amount of money. Cause $300 million is a ton of money, but when you're up against, you know, the global economy, <laughs> it's, it's not a, it's not that big of a, of a fighting, fighting chance. Um, and one of the things I loved about the book was how you started every chapter with uh, a quote for either by right. from him or from someone else that, that knew him really well. And it was always like a perfect, perfect little synopsis. Um, and I, I, I loved him, but my, one of my favorite little, there's so many little one-liners throughout the book that I, I tried to write down when I could. <laughs> and my, <laughs> one of my, my favorite is the whole, you know, with, um, the North Face, where he got his MBA, the management by absence. <laughs> right. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. But, you know, going from that hardcore capitalist to a conservationist is such an interesting idea. And one of the things that you talk about in the book is how he did it versus the way uh, Chenard did it with uh, the company Patagonia that he started. Uh, can you kind of talk about like the the thinking behind what he did versus a Chenard where he was directly funding organizations, as you kind of mentioned, where Chenard started the 1% for the planet, but also tried to make his materials as sustainable as possible and, you know, increase the market for uh, organic cotton or, or whatever. Can you kind of talk about the differences between the two people, but also between the two uh, uh, strategies, I guess? Yvonne Chenard and Doug Tompkins were quite the odd couple. In certain ways, they had a marriage because they were together 56, 58 years. They met as teenagers. They loved each other dearly. They traveled together. Sometimes they went to jail. Sometimes they almost went to jail. Sometimes they made peaks. These guys were, they were so poor when they first started hanging out together that when they were in the colder parts of the United States, they would sleep in the goodwill boxes because you could jump into the goodwill box and burrow down and it was warm goes to goodwill at four in the morning but i guess apparently somebody does because they said they were always being woken up by people throwing like bales of like donated clothes on top of them um for food they were eating um canned cat food because there was a place in oakland where you could buy dented cans of food for like half price because a dented can can't last as long and of all the dented cans the dented cat food was the cheapest so you know they're living in a goodwill dump or they're eating canned cat food with dents because it's cheaper and and they were loving it. You know, they, these guys had, they ran away from life and they never thought of being, you know, going to a personal coach or, you know, these dudes were just living on the edge and they became accidental businessmen because the equipment they needed just wasn't there. So it was as if you were a surfer in Indonesia in 1920 and you want to surf and the surfboards are terrible. And all of a sudden you start, you know, carving and shaping your own boards. That's kind of what they did. Yvonne Gennard shapes the ice axe, Doug Tompkins, the North Face, I don't know if you want to call them the, uh, the DNA of the outdoor industry, but there's a little bit of, you know, Watson and Crick here of, of these two guys who invented this new world. And they were very connected, but very different. You know, the DNA of, of Yvonne Chouinard is, he comes from a hunter trapper family, lots of French influence, really good with his hands, iron worker. Doug Tompkins is the son of, you know, people from the uh, Mayflower who, who are definitely blue blood East Coasters and uh, lots of museums. This is a kid who went to a lot of museums as a child. So he had a, he had a real culture highbrow look at the world. And Doug was very, very worried that the environmental crisis of the mid eighties was so dire that there wasn't time to do 1% for the planet. You know, he wanted to do 50% for the planet. And I believe uh, it was E.O. Wilson and when, or half planet, when Doug heard that, he, he just kind of smiled and said, that sounds like a good start. <laughs> Doug Tompkins really was much more radical. He was a deep admirer of uh, Earth First. He, he went on missions with the Sea Shepherds. He tried to attack the Japanese whaling boats. Uh, he loved just taking a mountain bike and going to Earth First, uh, Round River Rendezvous, kind of on the sly. This is a guy who would sleep on the floor, sleep on the couch, sleep on the boat. You know, the last place you find Doug Tompkins is a five-star hotel. This is a this is a dirtbagger who uh, loved being a dirtbagger, and uh, Yvonne Chenard was a dirtbagger who loved being a dirtbagger. And Yvonne was more stable and wanted to like stay in the business and and donate over time. And Doug wanted to get the hell out of business. 
uh, and he wanted to do, you know, fund his own little revolution. You talk about the, the, the world of cutting edge environmentalism and, you know, some pretty intense stuff with the uh, earth first and uh, the sea shepherd attacking the, the whaling boats. And, you know, as awesome as that is, it's, it's dangerous, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty intense. And, you know, you kind of already mentioned that he was with his endeavors in, in Chile, he was kind of attacked by right-wing governments um, and, you know, large corporations that had interests in the natural resources of Patagonia. And our experience is when we went down there in 2010, we were just traveling through and people would ask what we're doing. And we'd say, oh, we're going to go volunteer for a month with the Tompkins, you know, group. And I would say it was about 50-50. Half people were right. like, oh, great. That's super fun. You should have a great time. Patagonia is beautiful. The other people were like, oh, that Tompkins, right. white guy from the U.S. thinks he can come and buy up our land. And I always found that really interesting. But after reading your book, it, it's, it's funny how much of that was shaped the public opinion was shaped by large corporations and right-wing media or right-wing uh, uh, governments or whoever it was. And then as soon as he passed, it became clear that everyone really came together about what he was trying to do. Correct. Honestly, Jonathan, if you don't mind speaking to that, because that is a really interesting thing. We, that is something we experienced while we were there. Not a lot of people were on um, his side that we ran into. And then once he passed, there's this, you, you paint it perfectly in the book. It completely switched. So do, do you have any thoughts on what that is? Well, it's kind of interesting. It's almost like when you think of like legal, legal, you can, you're not supposed to slander people uh, when they're alive, but once they die, you're kind of allowed to talk the truth. In this case, it was the exact opposite. Chile was such an upside down democracy that you could slander people while they're alive and get away with it. And then when they died, you could actually acknowledge who they were. Massive smear campaign by the Catholic church, by a right-wing government, by right-wing water corporations, uh, he, the Chilean secret police. It was like a who's who. And in my book, I interviewed one of the secret agents who's job was to harass Tompkins. He worked for the ANI, which is the National Intelligence Agency of Chile. And I found him, he's about 80 years old, old dude working like on the government books and, you know, doing nothing. And I said, hey, I want to talk to you about Tompkins. And he said to me, he said, you know, when, uh, when you leave the ANI, everybody gets Alzheimer's, they forget everything. We never talk about anything. He goes, but I didn't get Alzheimer's. He goes, I remember everything. So we went out and drank a bunch of Pisco Sours. And he told me that the reason that you could attack Tompkins is that if you are on the left wing and you punched him, you were punching a gringo. And if you are on the right wing and you punched him, you were punching a heretic. And so there was no cost to punching him. He was the perfect punching bag. Everybody could get a shot at him and in their own little weird ideolo ideology defend it. He said there was no cost to punching Tompkins. And for me, that was a perfect enemy and Chile needed an enemy because they were coming out of a dictatorship and they needed somebody to kind of focus their wrath upon and Doug not only received all that wrath but as a brilliant communication strategist and a, and, a, and a genius in marketing he turned all that wrath and threw it back at him and burned their ass no that's amazing man and you know this could be a whole other conversation going down, you know, the interaction with the Chilean government, especially at the time of transition that they really were um, at that time, especially. But I, I'm also curious because um, he was he was the perfect punching bag. Um, I'm also curious how much of the interaction and the change in perspective on Doug and Conservación Patagonica um, is also reminiscent of a change in environmental perspectives globally. Um, you know, is that, cause he was also iterative with that. He was leading conservation movement in a lot of ways, but then the conservation movement was all, is also growing and maturing globally at the same time. So I'm just curious what your thoughts are on, on that interaction between the two. 
it, no, it's a great question because Doug Tompkins was a visionary, but it's a little easier to be a visionary if you grew up in the acid days of 19, late 60s San Francisco. You know, it kind of came with the turf being a visionary. And so he had the, the capability to have that kind of San Francisco counterculture, look what's coming uh, vision, but with a global businessman, you know, who's cutting million dollar deals in Tokyo and Hong Kong. So he was able to harvest all these different skills. And I think that allowed Doug Tompkins to not only see the world, but to see future environmental problems long before other people did. So all the development of Patagonia for 30 years, from 1990 to 2020, he really thought that public opinion would catch up. So he didn't see his job as running a business and doing 1% for the planet forever, as his friend Yvonne Chouinard did. Doug saw his position as build a firewall, whatever it takes, stop these bastards from cutting down my forests, damming my rivers and polluting my bays. And in 20 or 30 years, there'll be millions of people who agree that an intact forest is worth more than a destroyed forest. And, you know, if you think about it, it's not that different from the change from whaling to whale watching in a fast forward way. Doug Tompkins was very clearly aware that an intact forest, intact river long term, not only was morally and ecologically, but even commercially the sound way to go. And so there was really no logical way to attack Doug Tompkins. So you had to invent smears and, and even criminal actions against him to try and stop him. And Yvonne Chouinard, of course, you know, chugged away and never, never slowed down. But I think that to understand Doug Tompkins, you really have to think of a, of a San Francisco visionary who knew that he was on the frontier of environmental activism. He knew that the way was going to break in his favor. He could just hold the forces of development at bay for 30 years. He figured the citizens themselves could then protect it. And that's exactly what happened. And I guess to kind of even contextualize that even further, you, you mention in the book um, a quote from Chris Tompkins when when she was really in the fight in Patagonia. Somebody sent her a book about the grand the fight to protect the Grand Tetons in Wyoming, and she said that was when it hit me. It was the first time I realized we were just part of an ongoing ongoing story of conservation, um, and I think that's so relevant and so poignant, and it speaks to. Um, you know, like how you started, you know, how you were telling us, you know, working with The Guardian, when you bring up Doug, Doug Tompkins, everyone gets excited because it's so nice to have these positive stories in conservation. Right. And so, yeah, could you, you know, looking at that, looking at their successes, looking at what Chris said, you know, we're just part of a larger ongoing story. And this is a success. This was a huge success. There are so many of these other successes that are out there. Does it equal out? That's, is that even for us to say? But there are these amazing stories that like Smithsonian Earth Optimism, like we focus on, and we're really trying to um, highlight these. Is this life of Doug, <laughs> is this <laughs> project in Patagonia, um, what is that in your perspective in this, in compared to that? Is this the front runner? Is this one just piece of it? Is it just another part of the quilt? What, what is this? No what, Doug, no, what Doug Tompkins did to the environmental movement is he was able to, to spread his uh, financial wealth among dozens and hundreds of small groups around the world. So you have people in Holland, you have people in the, in the Caribbean, you have people in the States. So Doug Tompkins really believed in networking. You know, he was one of the early things he does as a conservationist is, is summits where he invites 15 or 20 of the top people in a field uh, Mike Soule, the, the people from Earth First, John Davis. And he brings all these people together at his house and people sleep on the floor. And he's just, you know, he's saying to Dave Foreman, you know, you've come up with this you know, program for interconnected wilderness areas. You know, I'll put the money on the table. You, you know, go start, go start the revolution. Trying to do direct action to save a river, you know, he might finance it for you. You know, his daughter, Quincy said, you know, my job was to make sure everything was legal. <laughs> so, you know, Doug Tompkins, Doug Tompkins was able to use his knowledge of the environmental movement to see what was coming, to be able to build like this kind of this factory of, uh, of activism. I think if you look at the legacy of Doug Tompkins in Argentina, where he has huge parks, you see a whole generation of, of uh, park guards, of wildlife biologists who are you know, being paid to look at the jaguars, the people who are able to live off the land thanks to Doug's organic 
uh, farming experiments. You have hundreds of tour guides. Doug is seeded some of the most beautiful parts of the world with an alternative economy. And whether or not it's going to work, we have no idea. This it could be just as much of a failure as capitalism, but I really doubt it. And even if his you know, new economy, as he called it, or the next economy, even if it's a total failure, at least he didn't destroy the land in the process. So I think to understand what Doug Tompkins has left the world, you have to fly over Argentina. You have to look at the wetlands of Ibarra. You have to explore the, you know, the look at some of his footage when he's flying over Patagonia and he's going between volcanoes and forests and rivers, all these places he saved. And on the ground, Doug really thought that if you didn't have a ring of locals protecting your project, you were screwed. So it's very notable that when Doug first starts settling lands in Southern Chile, you know, what is the right wing press says he's doing? He's kicking all the poor farmers off the land and drowning their babies. Well, actually what he was doing is he was offering people uh, full pay to live in the watersheds and he built a school for their kids, which really isn't that common. So basically he was, he was uh, an imperial lord in some ways, but of all the imperial lords, it was quite an interesting one because what he wanted to do was save the watershed. It's, you know, he, he wasn't interested in uh, taking land from the people. Quite the opposite, you know. I always call Doug, you know, in some ways, the last king of Patagonia because he created a commonwealth and then he gave it to the people so there can never be a king anymore. <laughs> At one point, he decides to visit his friend, uh, Yvonne Chouinard, who's nearby in Argentina. So Doug, who's got a, you know, a couple of planes, hops in his uh, Cessna, flies over to Argentina, probably does not notify the customs or the border patrol, which le leads to all sorts of problems for Doug Tompkins. Because I do remember that, this is a bit of a side, but during this, uh, reporting this book, I would go into hangars in Chile, like pretty big hangars, and it'd be banners saying, under no circumstances can Mr. Doug Tompkins land or take off from this airport. <laughs> so in the early 1990s, Doug flies over to Argentina and to hang out with his buddy, Yvonne Chouinard. Yvonne is giving up the company, handing over to a new generation of leadership. And the CEO of Patagonia, Chris McDivitt, uh, a Scottish woman who's uh, been working with Shinar for 30 years and is kind of like the, the number one executive there. She is also with Shinard and she and Doug flirt a little bit and they end up uh, flirting and having dates in Paris and dates here and there. And they eventually uh, fall madly in love. And she joins Doug on this crazy quest to live in the middle of nowhere and start an environmental revolution. And so Doug's the perfect like rocket ship, you know, just like light him and he'll go off. And Chris is like Houston, and she's able to actually d direct the rocket and make sure it actually doesn't go to like Pluto or something. Because Doug without Chris is like, it's like North Korea. You know, it's, it might be interesting, but it's not going to solve anything. And Chris is Scottish, and she's pretty practical. So they were really one made for another. And she was, you know, she'd been running a multi million dollar company for years. His advertising budget when he was an executive in Esprit was $2 million a month in the 80s. So, you know, this guy knew how to do campaigns and marketing. She was a brilliant executive and team builder. So the two of them were like this dynamic duo. And for people who want to know about conservation, about like how you can do something positive for the world, this, the story of Doug Tompkins goes way beyond conservation. This is not a book that's trying to shine his shoes for him. You know, I scuff them up and he scuffed them up and I tell you they're scuffed up and people scuff me up because I talk about the scuffs, but that's just the way it is when you write a biography. So I think that the, the takeaway from this is that whether it's conservation or not conservation, you're able to read this book and get a look into, you know, a dreamer who pulled it off. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. Dreamer who pulled it off because he did. And so along those lines, as kind of mentioned earlier, um, we, we based this series, The Possibilists, off of the Michael Soule quote. Uh, you know, when people ask me if I'm optimistic or pessimistic, I say that I'm possibilistic because it takes the, uh, the mindset that with the right attitude or with the right resources, anything is possible. And that is, I, I don't know an example better. I can't think of one uh, better than, than than Doug Tompkins. He he came, you know, from the bottom, created these companies that made him so much money. And then, like, as we said, he just turned it and said, you know, here's what I want to do with this. So 
this is kind of like an open-ended question, but with the the idea of possibilism, can you maybe share what that means to you personally, but also how uh, Doug, as a as a person, as with his legacy, fits into that that idea of possibilistic actions and possibilism as a whole? Well, I think that for me, the whole idea came from my mother because as a small child, I was pretty skinny and I got sick a lot. I missed school a lot. I was sick a lot, you know, not, not super healthy little kid. And so my mom was always, my mom was a public, she was a public school teacher and a kindergarten teacher. So she used to say, oh my God, this kid's having a rough time. So she would say, you know, you're a survivor. You're a survivor. If there, if you were in the concentration camps, you would have survived. She was a little worried. So she taught, you know, through her, she, she taught me that, you know, no matter what you survive. And, uh, on our refrigerator as a small child, there was a Margaret Mead co- quote saying basically, you know, never doubt that a small group of people can change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that does. And so I think from a small, uh, from a very young age, I was taught that, uh, you know, revolutions come from a couple dozen people. And my daughter who was then 11, my daughter Zoe says to me, you know, I don't get it dad. You say before you, before you die, you have to make the world a little bit better. Why not a lot better? And I thought, okay, so they get it way more than we do. And I think Doug Tompkins in the same way, he really, he understood that his legacy would be something that would outlive him by centuries. He, he had no doubt, you know, that these, they were looking at about 600 years and they were, they were really convinced that if they planted a forest of a redwood called the Lerse, uh, if they planted it now in 900 or 1200 years, it would be a perfectly middle-aged forest. And they were looking out on such a time frame that was so distinct from what you see from a publicly traded company that has to report every 90 days and has you know, obligations to shareholders. These, you know, Doug Tompkins, he was looking at the world with the, you know, the possibility of reforesting 100,000 acres, of the possibility of making, I think, nine national parks, you know, his impossible dream became possibility and that, you know, he just kept going. He just, you know, was two steps forward, one back, two steps forward, one back. You know, he just, the guy was, he really was a mountain climber and for him, the mountain was, you know, beat the bureaucracy. Half of his life was fighting with government bureaucrats who like didn't understand the maps as well as he did. So I think that when you think of like what's possible and why is Doug Tompkins an example of possibilism, it's, you know, he took on, impossible challenges, knowing that you can actually shape your own reality and certain leaders, you know, I'm sure when Elton John gets on stage and starts singing, he's shaping a lot of realities there, you know, and I think that Doug Tompkins had that ability to, to portray a dream so dramatic and so romantic and so impossible that who doesn't want to be part of an impossible dream? What we're calling possibilism to Doug was impossibilism. And it was like, tell me what's impossible. I'm more challenging. Yeah, more, more challenging. Go up, go up. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you do it with a rope. I'll fucking do it without the rope. <laughs> I love it. I love it, man. You tell me it's not even about possibilism because, in a way, that's almost like a negative connotation. You tell me what's impossible, and I'm going to tell you that I can do it. And that, that in s- such an important way, is, is the narrative of conservation and a narrative of what a lot of Smithsonian earth optimism is trying to highlight and what we're trying to highlight, uh, you know, people that have brought back um, anteaters, the people that have brought back uh, Ugandan uh, gorillas. Um, uh, the, the, you, you mentioned Chris's work on the jaguars in the, uh, the wetlands of Argentina and, uh, you know, this rewilding aspect um, that would have been impossible 10 years ago. And nobody would have believed it. So I, I love that answer. Oh, and I think in some ways it's, uh, I think I, I discovered that that kind of answer came from being a father, because I think that one of the things I always teach my kids is that, because the kids are always losing shit, always. It's like, I mean, if you have seven kids, like they're losing like three, every kid loses, there's like 20, 21 lost things a day. That's like an hour. If you say, if you tell your brain, you're going to look for it, you're already kind of throwing in the doubt of um, uh, maybe it's not gonna happen, but if you put in your brain, you're gonna find it. So I teach, I taught my kids very early to find stuff. And I think Doug Tompkins, when he chooses an impossible path, he says, I'm gonna find the path, you know, I'm going up 
sloth wall in Yosemite in the 60s. And, you know, you know, we're kind of inventing paths that have only been done two or three times. So it's an impossible task, but he's going to find a new route. <laughs> you created something special, man. You really did. You created something really special with this. It's, it's, a, it's an ass kicker. It really is. Uh, yeah, thank no. you. It's also a map. It's also a map. In certain ways, you can read it as a map because if you read between the lines, there's a, there's a lot of stuff you can follow up on. Jonathan, can you, uh, thank you so much for, for joining us and for writing this book. Again, we loved it. We're, we're so excited to tell the, the whole story, the Tompkins story. Um, so can you tell our audience where they can find your, your work, some of your journalism work, uh, so, uh, this book and other books? Uh, please just tell us all about where we can uh, consume more of your content. <laughs> For those uh, who want to understand Doug Tompkins' story, I'd say the best idea is to, the audiobook is awesome. It's a great reader. Um, we all have eight hours where we should be listening to something instead of staring at like the car in front of us or people in the, in the, in the supermarket. Most libraries have a wild idea, so you can get it there. Um, you, you know, most bookstores have it. Uh, so it's pretty easy to find. If you do, you know, Tompkins, a wild idea or a wild idea in Frank, then you can find that everywhere. So that's not a problem. But what I think more important is if you buy it, like try and get like three or four people to read it because uh, it's really, Doug's ideas are going to, are going to see a lot of the little revolutions. And for anybody who cares about the earth, 50 years from now, Doug Tompkins is going to be kind of up there in this kind of crazy niche. You know, he climbed his own, you know, he climbed his own route. If you want to see a roadmap, uh, you know, get the audiobook, buy the buy it. Library's got it. You know, if you want to find it, it's not difficult. Well, awesome. Thank you so much again. We really appreciate your time and yeah, and the book again, such an amazing story. So thank you, thank you, thank you. We wanted to say thank you again to Jonathan Franklin. So please go find and read A Wild Idea. And go look for his other books like 438 Days or The 33 Men and his many, many articles. He is such a great storyteller. Hosts and producer for this episode are Austin Parker and Taylor Parker. Producers are Kat Coots and Andrea Santi. Music was provided by A Picture Book Studios. Please like, comment, and subscribe to our page if you haven't already. Thanks again. We'll talk to you next time.